गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई बालक दास पूर्वी वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आई एस एफ कॉलेज ऑफ फार्मेसी इन द आई एस एफ सी पी डायलॉग सीरीज अंडर द एजीज ऑफ आई क्यू एस सी एंड आई आई सी ऑफ आई एस एफ सी पी मोगा सो टूडे वी हैव डॉक्टर एम एस सुधीश सर एज अवर एक्सपर्ट फॉर द डे सो वेलकम यू सर डॉक्टर एम एस सुधीश सर इज वर्किंग एज एच ओ डी एंड एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फार्मास्यूटिक्स अमृता स्कूल ऑफ फार्मेसी अमृता विद्यापीठम कोची सर कंप्लीटेड हिज बी फॉर्म एम फॉर्म एंड पी एच डी फ्रॉम डॉक्टर हरी सिंह और यूनिवर्सिटी सागर एंड देन पोस्ट डॉक फ्रॉम क्योटो फार्मास्यूटिकल यूनिवर्सिटी क्योटो जापान सर करेंट एरिया ऑफ रिसर्च इज स्टडी एंड एनालिसिस ऑफ प्रोटीन एब्जॉर्बन और नैनो पार्टिकल्स एंड इट्स को रिलेशन विथ बायो कंपेटेबिलिटी एंड दिस इज स्पॉन्सर्ड बाई डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया सर एज ऑल्सो वर्क ऑन स्टडी ऑफ क्रिस्टलाइजेशन एंड प्रिसिपिटेशन ऑफ बी सी एस क्लास टू ड्रग्स एंड इट्स इम्प्लीकेशन टू टोटल ड्रग टू ओरल ड्रग एब्जॉर्बन एंड साइमल्टेनियसली डेवलपमेंट ऑफ सेल्फ मल्सीफाइंग ड्रग डिलीवरी सिस्टम्स सर एज रिसीव कंसल्टेंसी फ्रॉम मैन कॉन प्राइवेट लिमिटेड अमाउंट एट लैक फॉर द बायो अवेलेबल फॉर्मुलेशन ऑफ करकोमेंट एंड सर एज कंप्लीटेड वेरियस डी एस टी स्पॉन्सर्ड प्रोजेक्ट एंड एम फाउंड एम पी सी एस टी स्पॉन्सर्ड वर्कशॉप ऑन डिफरेंट टॉपिक्स सो सर एज वेरी वास्ट एक्सपीरियंस एज अकेडमिक एंड रिसर्च इन द फील्ड ऑफ फॉर्मेसी एंड होप टूडे लेक्चर विल बी वेरी बेनिफिशियल फॉर द फार्मा प्रोफेशनल तो बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द लेक्चर आई रिक्वेस्ट टू अवर डायरेक्टर सर टू प्लीज इनलाइटन द प्रोग्राम ऑफ एक्सपर्ट लेक्चर सीरीज सर प्लीज से फ्यू वर्ड्स थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर Thank you very much, Dr. Balak ji. So first of all, I welcome today's dynamic, dedicated uh, professionals, Dr. M. S. Sudhir ji from core of my heart in this ISF dialogue series. And I know that you did the, your education one of the uh, very very historical and well known institute in the India. And now you are working in the also one of the institute is the well known and uh, very very recognized by the very professional uh, bodies in a ranking holder institute. So congratulation to you, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation to deliver a talk in this ISF dialogue series. So as you know that the purpose behind of the ISF dialogue series, this is the only reason that I am meeting with the Dr. M S Sudhirji because I know that. it is not possible to connect to the peoples during the day to day life or during the professional life and this is the only platform where we can meet as a personally as well as when the student they can watch your youtube say or lecture they can also connect a number of the professional they can also connect institute as well as the person those who deliver the lecture on this platform because this is the only platform where we we are the open to discuss to each and everybody so thank you very much uh, dr sudhir ji for accepting our invitation and provide the opportunity to our student as well as the professional to listen you as well as what you have to the deliver over here it will be the follow in the research and the future also so without taking time uh, i again request to the dr sudhir ji please continue your talk and give your brief uh, information related to your talk and justify uh, things which is the useful for the candidate as well as the researcher so thank you very much and thanks to the isf dialogue series for provide the opportunity to interact such types of the young and dynamic uh, you can say experts and i know that uh, amrita university is doing the good job as well as the all department so this is my personal soft corner with the uh, amrita uh, institute and university so as and when we have the time i also want to the connect with your university of your pharmacy department and we also work together with some of the collaborative if it is possible and university vice chancellor and principal of the pharmacy college if they can agree 
then this is uh, my request to you you can give the our uh, information to your principal and we can connect with you in the detail on the telephone so thank you very much dr sudeesh ji over to dr balak thank you respected director sir so welcome uh, to dr ms sudeesh sir for your talk on the topic role of bio nano interface in nano medicine so uh, please sir you can start and upload your slides okay uh, so uh, is it audible yes sir yeah so let me share my slides first is it visible is it visible hello yes, yes sir visible visible yeah 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 okay so uh, first of all i thank uh, dr gd gupta sir for giving me this opportunity to present my uh, work uh, in front of the audience and also i thank uh, dr balak uh, for giving uh, for inviting me to this lecture series and uh, with that i think uh, i should start my presentation so shall shall i start my presentation sir sir please continue yeah yeah, yeah. okay so hello and welcome uh, everybody to this lecture series uh, and the topic which i am going to discuss here is role of nano bio interface in nano medicine so uh, in, in the first part of my presentation i'll be discussing about uh, the fundamentals of fundamentals of nanotechnology how this uh, cancer nano medicine works okay and in the second part of my uh, lecture i will be discussing about the nano bio interface okay so nano bio interface is essentially one of uh, the mechanisms by which uh, the nanoparticles work and it may be due to which uh, the nano the, the current nanotechnology is facing some hurdles and by the understanding of nano bio interface we will be able to solve the problems existing problems of cancer nano medicine uh, which exist currently okay so first we'll begin with some of the fundamentals of cancer nanotechnology and we'll then move on to the downside of nanotechnology why nanotechnology is facing some problems and how to overcome those problems okay so let's get started so uh, the first part i will discuss about the drug delivery uh, optimized drug delivery what what is meant by drug delivery and what is the most ideal form of drug delivery okay so the ideal form of drug delivery can be uh, called as the optimized drug delivery and this requires the drug to reach the site of action and what is the site of action the site of action for a drug may be like uh, its uh, receptor or maybe a cell or it may be some enzymes so the drug should reach at the right dose uh, at the site of action at the right time at the site of action and for the correct duration of action so uh, the essentially the drug which goes into the body should reach at the right dose at the right time and for the correct duration at the site of action okay at the same time the drug should not cause any toxicity which is due to the drug going to the non target sites so essentially, essentially the drug should reach the target site of, at the right dose at the right time and for the correct duration of action so this is called as the optimized drug delivery or it's, it is the ideal form of drug delivery but what happens in the real world like for example if you take a uh, aspirin tablet the aspirin tablet goes into your stomach it uh, disintegrates and dissolves then it moves into your intestine from intestine it absorbed in, into the blood and if you imagine a, a one compartment uh, uh, one compartment model it is just like a tank filled with water and when you add a dye it uniformly distributes all over the place in the in that tank similarly the drug which reaches the blood Uh, distributes all over the body okay so what we want is the drug to reach only to the target and not to distribute throughout the body okay so what is the problem with this 
The problem is that out of the 250 mg of the drug which we are giving, only microgram or nanogram quantity of the drug is reaching the target. Rest of the 99.9% of the drug is a total waste. It is not having any therapeutic effect. Just that microgram quantity which reaches the target is, is what is required. So for that, we have to give 250 mg. Otherwise, you will not reach the required concentration at the target site. Okay. So this form of drug delivery is, uh, is highly inefficient. Okay. So what we want is we want to improve the drug delivery to achieve the optimized drug delivery uh, which we are talking about, the optimized form of drug delivery. So uh, in my talk, I'll be discussing on these following outlines. Uh, so first, I'll be discussing about anatomical and physiological barriers. So for the drug to reach uh, the, uh, the blood, it has to cross some uh, barriers. So that, that can be considered under anatomical and physiological barrier. Then I'll be focusing on some drug delivery challenges using the example of cancer nanotechnology and Doxil is a famous product. Uh, Doxil is a liposomal formulation of doxorubicin. The next part I'll be talking about the downside of nanotechnology. Why is it uh, not working as desired? What is the problem with nanotechnology? And in the third part, I will be discussing about nano bio interface and uh, and the lack of in vitro in vivo correlation in nanomedicine and uh, and what are the implications of nano bio interface. So let's let's go into the details. Okay, so this this slide is a little bit misplaced. So now uh, talking about the barriers, I I told that for the drug to reach the blood, it has to cross certain barriers. So these barriers are classified as epithelial barrier and endothelial barrier. So essentially the barriers are of two types, epithelial and broadly it is of epithelial barrier and endothelial barrier. On the left side, you can see uh, the route of administrations like oral, transdermal, ophthalmic, nasal, vaginal have the epithelial barrier. For example, if you apply a drug on surface of the skin, it has to cross the epithelial barrier on top of the skin. Okay. If you take a tablet uh, orally, it has to cross the epithelial barrier of the intestinal membrane. If you give uh, a drug uh, through the eye, it has to cross the epithelial barrier of the, uh, of the cornea. Okay. So all these routes of administration on the left side, the drug has to cross the epithelial barrier. Whereas uh, on the right side, you have two, uh, it is a little bit misplaced. It is intramuscular and uh, subcutaneous route of delivery. So what is, what is an endothelial barrier? So the, our capillaries and uh, arteries are made up of cells which are called as endothelial cells. So when you give a drug by intramuscular route, the drug has to cross these uh, capillary cells which are made up of endothelial cells and then will appear in the blood. Okay, so in these two routes of administration, uh, that is intramuscular and subcutaneous, the drug has to cross the endothelial barrier of the capillary and then it will appear in the blood. So once the drug crosses these barriers, whether it be epithelial or the endothelial barrier, it reaches something which is called as the central compartment or which is known as the blood compartment. In the blood compartment, the drug can move to two directions or both the directions. Like it can go to the target compartment, it can go to the to toxic compartment. For example, uh, if you see cancer, uh, if you take the example of a cancer, the cancer tissue is the target compartment. Okay, and what is the toxic compartment? For example, uh, doxorubicin or the doxil is a drug which is a ca anti cancer drug, which, but it has a cardiotoxicity problem. It has a toxicity problem in the uh, heart. So, heart will be the toxic compartment and the cancer tissue will be the target compartment. So, uh, the objective of a drug delivery scientist or, or a formulation size scientist is to maximize the drug concentration in the target compartment and minimize the concentration at the toxic compartment. So th this is the whole purpose of doing the drug delivery to improve uh, targeting and to reduce the toxicity. Okay. So uh, now let us study, uh, let us put all these items into scale. Okay. So let's see the example of red blood cells, red blood cells, the size of cells. Uh, I want you to know and understand and appreciate the, the role of size. Okay, so the red blood cells, 
the size of red blood cells is 7 microns and 7 microns is 7000 nanometer the size of liposomes is 100 nanometer you know 100 nanometer liposome 7000 nanometer rbc so there is a 70 times difference between the size of a liposome and a rbc now compare that with a aspirin molecule the aspirin molecule is uh, around the size of less than 1 nanometer okay so huge difference between the size of aspirin molecule and size of liposome and size of rbc okay so just keep this in mind as we move forward so uh, other molecules like protein molecules like antibodies are of in the size range of 20 nanometer antibodies are 20 nanometer bacteria is in the size range of 2 to 5 microns so these are the size ranges of various biological entities which which are important for drug delivery okay just keep in mind the size of aspirin molecule liposome and the rbcs as we move forward now uh, this uh, nanomedicine as we know are injected intravenously so this uh, for cancer the chemo in case of cancer the chemotherapeutic medicines are in general given intravenously so what is the fate of a intravenously administered product whether it be a injection or whether it be a nanoparticulate injection okay so when you inject something intravenously uh, the drug goes to the heart then to the lungs and then back to the heart and then it is pumped throughout the body as you know that uh, venous blood is deoxygenated so therefore after going to the heart it, it will go to the lungs to get deoxygenated come back to the heart and then it is pumped throughout the body okay so when this is pumped throughout the body the first uh, first area of entry or the first portal of entry is a artery called aorta so aorta the artery is a thick walled pipe you can imagine uh, aorta as a thick walled pipe okay so anything which goes through that wall will not leak out okay so these arteries are thick walled and nothing can leak out of this artery but this when this artery branches into capillaries the capillaries are uh, you, you can see your tissues are full of a network of capillaries okay so at the level of capillaries the permeability increases so capillary is a very thin walled tube like structure and from which uh, stuff can le leak into the tissues okay so your your tissues are like uh, consist of a network of capillaries from which things can leak out so what can leak out what cannot leak out is is a major question so uh, the the plasma present in the blood can leak out into the into the tissue little bit not completely and along with that your drug aspirin molecule can leak out into the blood uh, into the tissue but liposomes cannot leak into the tissue because liposome size 100 nanometer is huge as compared to aspirin molecule so only molecules can leak into the tissues neither liposome nor rbcs can leak into the tissues so the question is how can we target tissues using a liposomes when it cannot cross the endothelial barrier of the capillary so the answer to this question is using the using the biology of the disease biology of the disease means i'll give you an example of cancer uh, in, in in case of cancer uh, the cancerous tissue is different from a normal tissue and we utilize the biology of the cancer tissues to target drug to a uh, to a cancer tissue okay so let's understand what the cancer tissue looks like so in in, in this photograph you can see this is a fluorescence photograph so this uh, green color is a cancer tissue and this red colored line what you see is a is a capillary and this red color uh, is stained endothelial cells okay so you can see this uh, capillary gap and, and in between the capillary you can see growth of cells the green uh, color is also inside the capillary that means what the cells of the of the cancer tissue also grows inside the capillary and blocks the capillary so one thing is the capillary is blocked second thing is the capillary is broken due to overgrowth of cells okay so in the in the right side you can see a cartoon diagram in which it shows that the 25 percent of the perimeter of the capillary consists of tumor cells so there is a blockage in the capillary capillary is more leaky in in, in the cancer tissues and we take advantage of this leaky capillary in the cancer tissue 
okay so once the capillary is uh, having uh, is leaky the liposomes can now go into the tissues so that is the difference between a normal tissue and a cancer tissue in normal tissue the liposome cannot leak into the tissues because of the barrier property of the capillary whereas in case of cancer tissues uh, the capillary is leaky and therefore the liposomes can easily go out of the capillary and accumulate in the cancer tissues okay so with that background we'll study another important concept which is may be known to most of, most of the mcom students or maybe the phd students which is called as the enhanced permeability and retention effect i told you the capillary uh, in the cancer tissues are leaky and stuff can leak out into the into the tissues uh, and what about the retention now whatever is leaked into the tissue is is taken back into the lymphatic system and then circulated back or uh, it is removed from the body okay but in case of cancer tissues uh, due to overgrowth of these cancer cells the lymphatic system is also blocked okay so on the one hand you have a uh, permeable capillary on the other hand there is a blocked lymphatic system so whatever leaks into the cancer tissue gets accumulated in the cancer tissues and that's how we get maximum targeting of liposomes or any nanoparticles into the tissue and this catch phrase enhanced permeability and retention effect is very popular as a as the theoretical basis of cancer targeting now uh, let's see uh, how this happens in uh, in in real animal model so in the, in this photograph you can see uh, in the top left you can see this this is a skin cancer model melanoma model in a rat and this is at zero hour when when the nanoparticle particulate formulation is injected so what is this nanoparticulate formulation in this example it is a conjugate of evans blue with albumin and evans blue is a dye which is conjugated to albumin in the form of a nanoparticulate complex at zero over when it is given uh, you can see there is nothing in the tissue after 6 hours you can see the accumulation of nanoparticles uh, and that blue color suggest uh, is due to the evans blue that is a staining agent which is conjugated to the albumin now after 24 and 72 hours also the everything is retained in the tissue as you can see the color is not diminishing it is retained as such so this is a classical example of enhanced permeability and retention effect so this is uh, the theoretical basis of uh, cancer nanotechnology now let's study the the structure of the doxyl which i was talking about doxyl is a liposomal doxorubicin doxorubicin as you know is an anti cancer drug and this this uh, liposome is just like a uh, water balloon okay so there is a aqueous compartment inside and is which is having a membrane made up of phospholipids so inside the aqueous compartment the drug may be entrapped into the aqueous compartment or it may be in, in the membrane bilayer on top of this membrane you have a pg coating okay so i'll not going to discuss the role of pg and things like that and this is the complete uh, anatomy of the doxel uh, or the liposomal doxorubicin the size of this is nearly 100 nanometer let's go ahead so coming uh, to some of the regulatory aspects of uh, liposomal uh, formulation or any nanoparticulate formulation there are three major regulatory pathways which is which are uh, 505b1 505b2 505j okay so you you might be knowing new drug application the whenever there is a new molecule uh, coming into the market it has to undergo this uh, 505b1 pathway so it is um, approved under the 505b1 pathway but all these nanoparticulate formulations are has to undergo 505b2 pathway which is the which is used for new formulation of existing drugs so you know you new formulation of existing drug that means the drug is already existing the doxorubicin molecule is all, all already existing we are just putting that drug into liposomes and therefore it has to undergo this 505b2 pathway okay so this is different from the nda new drug application so uh, the third is the 505j pathway that that is used for generic medicine after the patent get expired you know all this stuff so this is just to highlight this 505b2 pathway okay just coming to the next part 
so uh, so why is industry interested in this nanoparticulate formulation one of the reason why industry is interested is because of this uh, this approval process which is called as the accelerated approval okay and what is this accelerated approval because industry is business driven and you know for a new drug to come into market it takes uh, 10 to 13 years okay so uh, the chances of failure is very high in that but here you you get accelerated approval that means you speed up the process and then you are using a drug which is already approved so chances of getting approval is very very fast okay but this accelerated approval is given only under certain conditions and what are those conditions condition number one is drug uh, the disease which you are treating is serious or life threatening for example uh, cancer treatment by doxil is a classical example here second is when the drug appears to provide a clinical benefit not found in other drugs so whatever you're doing like liposomal doxorubicin it should be better than your uh, injection the doxorubicin injection so you should you should show a clinical uh, clinical benefit clear clinical benefit over the existing formulation and the third is uh, it is based on a surrogate endpoint so what is a surrogate endpoint in oncology the actual endpoint of uh, of a trial is uh, is known as the progression free survival okay that that is the actual endpoint progression free survival means how many years the patient is able to survive so for some type of cancer is uh, the uh, the progression free survival is very less like for for example pdac that is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma the survival is just 3 to 6 months very less but in case of some cancer like breast cancer and all it is quite high so the end point uh, may vary for different type of cancer in some type of cancer it may be like 5 years or it may be like 10 years or it may be more so this uh, clinical this clinical study cannot go endlessly to 5 years and 10 years it, it takes a lot of time to reduce this time there is another end point which is called as a surrogate end point so what is a surrogate endpoint that is based on some tumor regression model like you take a pet scan of the tumor and if the size of the tumor is regressing uh, uh, that that shows that the drug is working and there is a clinical benefit so this is not the the traditional progression free survival this is just the tumor regression which we are studying and we correlate the tumor regression with survival so if we we see that there is a tumor regression we believe that the drug is working and it will provide a clinical benefit to the patient so under these three uh, three, three uh, reasons uh, you get an accelerated approval process and that is that that attracts the industry a lot because you save a lot of money and you you make a lot of money because of this uh, this process now coming to the next part of my talk which is the downside of nanotechnology so this is an uh, article published by Kinam Park, who is uh, who was the editor in chief of Journal of Control Release, which is a very prestigious journal uh, in our field. And what he has to say is uh, this: using this EPR effect, there are a lot of publications uh, in the literature, but this has not translated into sufficient number of products. Okay, so the rate of translation is very low. So that means the, if you survey the market, the number of formulation, uh, nanoparticulate formulation is very less as compared to the number of uh, papers or the uh, published articles. And what is the reason for that? He says that the reality is that these assumptions, assumptions he's referring to the EPR uh, principle. So the reality that EPR have pro produced numerous research articles but have made no significant advances in translation into patient treatment. And these convenient misconceptions have to face the inconvenient truth. So essentially he's saying that nano, nanoparticulate formulation is not working that great as is assumed by the EPR principle. Now let's see what, what, what is the inconvenient truth he's talking about. So what is the inconvenient truth? So the clinical application of Taxol, Taxotrine, Abrexane, and Ginoxol. Here, the Taxol and Taxotrines are drug injection. They are not nanoparticulate. Whereas Abrexane and Ginoxol are nanoparticulate formulation. So clinical applications of these four formulations show that 
the later two nanoparticulate formulation that is abrexin and genoxol have similar performance to the first two which is which are based on solution formulation that is there is no difference uh, in particulate formulation when compared to solution formulations okay injection the amount of a drug delivered to the targeted tumor may be may, may be about the same for different formulations okay so he says that everything is equal there is no no clinical benefit when you put drug into nanoparticulate formulation so this is very uh, just contradictory to what we have learned in theory in in real practice we are not getting the clinic clinical ba benefit as we have seen in theory and as we have seen in animal models so that is a primary issue with uh, cancer nanotechnology and one of the reason for uh, for this downside of nanoparticles is our lack of understanding of basics basic na nano principles of nanotechnology still under investigation and not known completely okay so let's uh, let me introduce you to this concept of bio nano interface okay so you can see in this figure this nano particle uh, on the left side and uh, there are two arrows if there is no plasma okay so nano particles will remain the same but in presence of plasma what happens that the plasma proteins will make a coat on the surface of the particles and this is called as the protein corona now plasma consists of more than 3500 or odd proteins and these proteins can form a protein corona on surface of the nanoparticle and why is this is formed uh, from from basic physical pharmacy you know that when you reduce the particle size you increase the particle surface area and when you increase the particle surface area you increase the surface energy okay so this this nanoparticles are highly energetic it has a high thermodynamic uh, like it is at a uh, higher thermodynamic state and as you know that from the principle of thermodynamics every particle uh, every system try, tries to remain at a low energy state and how can a nanoparticle reduce its energy state one one method is by getting aggregated okay by getting aggregated it can reduce the surface free energy or the energy of the system the second but but we stabilize that particles by using uh, some surfactants and all so therefore they will not aggregate uh, in the in the formulation but what happens when you inject this particles into the blood D due to this high surface energy it will attract plasma proteins and that will result in a protein corona now what is what are the implications of this so uh, what we believe is uh, that the particles will go and hit its target uh, into the cell or the tissue cancer tissue as such but it doesn't happen uh, that way the particle is first coated by this nano, uh, this proteins and then the cell uh, is in, is not di in direct contact with the particle but it is in contact with the particle having a protein corona and that makes a huge difference now let's understand what difference does it make so you can see in this in, in this photograph that this is a surface of the cell okay this is the plasma membrane and these are the receptors and you can see these particles which is completely crowded with plasma protein so protein that is a protein coat over the over the particles okay and what can happen due to this 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 can lead to multiple biological effects now in this photographs you can see the difference between a synthetic identity of nanoparticles versus the biological identity of nanoparticles what is the synthetic identity see what we prepare in uh, in the in the lab the particles which we prepare in the lab and we characterize that in term in terms of size shape surface charge uh, hydrophobicity functional group polymorph every characterization uh, characterization of these nanoparticles uh, is known as the synthetic identity of that nanoparticles but once these particles are in the system in the blood you these particles acquire another identity which is known as the biological identity and what is that biological identity it is nothing but the the corona which is formed on the surface of the protein the particle is no more the same which we prepared in the lab now it is a different particle with a different coat over the surface okay now this protein corona which is formed on the particles can cause multiple biological effects like it can uh, result in a different circulation half life 
it can result in multiple uh, change in bio distribution chi change in bio compatibility biological stability target all these properties can be influenced by protein corona okay so one one of the influence of protein corona on targeting uh, can be seen in this image you can see that it is a normal practice uh, to use some ligands to target uh, cancer or any particular cell like you can use an uh, immunoglobulins antibodies to target uh, cancer or use folic acid to transfer so there can be if uh, these are called targeting ligands okay so these ligands are on top of the particles but when a corona is formed this 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 uh, ligands are shielded due to the presence of protein corona now the intended target is missing because of the formation of this protein so this can be one of the implications why nanoparticles are not working as a, uh, a, a in the form of active targeting so so the reason why we don't get a in vitro in vivo so every time we do a in vitro experiment it should correlate with a in vivo scenario like one of the common uh, protocols which we do in nanotechnology is to study the uptake of particles by macrophages okay so lower uptake means that the particle will circulate for a longer duration in the blood okay so we are using pristine particles the particle with its synthetic identity but when the identity of the particle is changed due to formation of protein corona you get a different uptake okay so whatever we are doing in vitro should mimic in vivo conditions so for that we have to study the biological uh, identity because biological identity is what is happening inside the human body so that may be uh, the reason for poor in vitro in vivo correlation and we can work on the protein corona to understand more on this ibivc now if you uh, typically study a uh, protein corona you can see the list of proteins which forms the part of protein corona on the on this table okay so all these proteins can influence the bio fate of nanoparticles bio fate means what is the fate of nanoparticle whether it will remain in the blood or well, whether it will be cleared from the bl blood whether it will reach the intended target well it uh, whether it will be moving to some other target how, how is the bio distribution of the nanoparticles everything is influenced by uh, these proteins which are part of the protein corona okay so if you see this this uh, list of uh, points given here the cellular uptake mechanism of nanoparticle interna internalization intracellular fate of nanoparticles nanoparticle toxicity colloidal stability and drug everything can be influenced due to this formation of protein corona okay so we don't consider this when we do in vitro studies and that may be the reason of uh, lack of in vitro in vivo correlation okay so just one more important thing is that if you take a different particle or if you coat the particle with different type of uh, excipients like if you prepare a cationic particle and then you prepare a neutral particle and then you prepare an anionic particle all these three particle will attract different plasma proteins in blood why because of the different surface structure one is cationic will cationic particles may attract different protein from the plasma the neutral particle may attract a different protein from the plasma then uh, the anionic particles may attract different proteins from the plasma so depending on the protein corona it may have different fates uh, different bio fate in the human body so all these proteins so so you can say essentially the biological identity of a particle depends on the synthetic identity of the particle you change the synthetic identity you change the biological identity then you will change the biological outcome so these three are connected synthetic synthetic identity connected to biological identity which is connected to functionality functionality means all these listed things are functionality the cellular cellular uptake the internalization the toxicity colloidal stability everything will depend on the protein corona which in turn will depend on the synthetic identity so this is the basic point which i wanted to highlight when this uh, when students take up any project on on nanotechnology or the phd graduate students taking up this uh, this type of work should take into consideration the role of protein corona the type of proteins being being adsorbed on the surface of the protein and what is its effect on the biofeed so that is one of the missing links uh, 
during the past and this protein corona is known for maybe last last one decade or so and in intense research on this is ongoing so this may resolve all the problems related to nanotechnology in the future so uh, so that was uh, essentially my uh, take home message here uh, this is my lab uh, here at amrita and these are my students some pg student and graduate students at amrita and uh, as as sir told and as we know that we are an nac a double plus ranked and we have been granted the status of institute of eminence we focus in international ranking also and with that i thank you so much for your patient hearing and uh, if you have any doubt or any questions regarding this talk you can mail me or call me at any time and if you have uh, time you can visit my lab at any time during your visit to kerala thank you so much definitely sir uh shall i close thank you sir thank you sir for your very informative lecture and very easy to understanding way for the pharmacy student this will definitely useful for the listeners and viewers of uh, from the pharmacy field i request to all the viewers and listeners please put your questions in and queries in chat box and we will reply you soon and after the consultation of our experts sir so before closing the session once again i heartily thanks to ms sudhi sir for accepting our invitation and sharing your experience for the budding pharma professionals thank you thank you very much sir and thank you sir. to all thank you sir thank you so much all right thank you great interacting with you all guys thank you so much thank you